But uh, since we just had Smokey talking high school football. But we're joined now by Ben Anderson of KSL Sports. Royce O'Neal and the Jazz moving on after a first round uh, victory over Memphis. And and Ben, uh, we'll start uh, with Royce O'Neal and kind of his unlikely rise to the, the starting lineup uh, with the Jazz. Over the last couple of years, how much of a surprise has he been and a contributor that, that has gotten this team to where they are at the top of the Western Conference? I mean, absolutely enormous. I, I mean, I remember I was hosting a, a radio show when the Jazz signed uh, Royce, and it was just, you know, you know they signed him out of Europe. He had played at Baylor and then went overseas for a couple of years. And the Jazz already had a full roster and had just drafted a local player with the last pick of the draft. You kind of thought, okay, he's going to earn that final roster spot. But then they went out and signed Royce O'Neal, and it turns out they'd given him a guaranteed contract right away, which, you know, is basically unheard of in the NBA, especially with European guys. So I remember thinking with my co-host, who is this guy? Well, what could this plan possibly be? Because we'd never heard of him. He wasn't a huge draft prospect coming out of Baylor even though he was so successful when he was there. And then he kind of came in and just did all the stuff that the Jazz called Jazz DNA, which is just he rebounds, you know, he does all the dirty work, he plays defense, and then he became an increasingly better and more reliable three-point shooter to the point where you really couldn't keep him out of the starting lineup. He was the type of guy who didn't need the ball in his hands to succeed, but when he got open shots, he knocked him down, and I think every team in the NBA needs that guy. What has kind of led to that evolution? You mentioned him knocking down the opportunities, but what kind of – turn the corner from him being that defensive presence and that kind of being just who he was to now being that threat that other teams have to account for? I, I think it's really been part of what the Jazz have become notorious for, which is their ability to develop players, whether that's sending them down to the G League or just working with them and being patient and saying, hey, we don't need you to be a star in year one or year two. We're going to give you until year three and four until you can become that guy. And you can see that across the board when you watch them play games. Now, I mean, Rudy Gobert was as big a project as there was in the NBA, and now he's turned himself into a legitimate star and defensive player of the year. Uh, Joe Ingles is that same type of player. George Niang, who comes out uh, as that same type of player. But you know what? The, the Jazz general manager or vice president of basketball operations is Dennis Lindsay, who you all know is a, is a former Baylor Bear himself, and he keeps close uh, close eyes on that, uh, on that uh, program. So I'm sure he was very familiar with what Royce O'Neal could do before he went to Europe saw him develop and said, hey, we, we think there's even more here that can be brought out of him. With their, I mean, this is a team that the last couple of years, Ben, has been on 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 the upswing. What's What's been the difference now? Is it is it, like like you said, everybody's now starting to come into their own. It's not just O'Neal and Gobert. Like, everybody's really coming in their own for the Jazz. Yeah, I mean, really, and look, this is probably true for every championship team or every championship contender. You have to have a superstar, and the Jazz really haven't had a superstar since Carl Malone left the roster. And, you know, they've had good players, Carlos Boozer, Andre Karolinko, Darren Williams. They've had guys. They just haven't had this guy. And now you look at what Darren, or I should say Donovan Mitchell, has done and developed into, and he just fell into the Jazz lap on draft night with a bad trade for the Denver Nuggets. And he just exceeded all expectations, somewhat like Royce O'Neal, just at a higher level, you know, just getting to that next echelon of player. And when you have a guy who, like last night, can score 30 points in 29 minutes and give you 10 assists and basically not miss from the field, you can win playoff games. And that's just what it's been. And sometimes you just get lucky. These stars fall in your lap. And I think that's been the biggest case. It's been Donovan Mitchell's evolution from a good player to an all-star. Now to that conversation as a superstar, as a top 10, top 15 player in the NBA when it gets to the postseason. Have uh, has there been much discussion? And this is just maybe looking at it in a weird way, but uh, you know the the whole coronavirus pandemic in sports started with Rudy Gobert, basically. I mean, not because of him, but he was the first you know public case that made everybody go whoa. And I remember being in a hotel room the night that that was announced, and just it felt like that was the moment the the world kind of changed. And now you fast forward a year here, the Jazz they're the first team to move forward in the Western Conference. Is it just kind of? crazy in a way to look back on where we were to, to where the Jazz are right now. Yeah, I mean, you couldn't write it. I mean, the, the craziness of what the last season has been, not just for the entire NBA, but for the Jazz specifically from that March 11th night in Oklahoma City when the, we learned that Rudy Gobert is going to sit out because we've been tracking it. They said he was dealing with some illness. They didn't really say what it was. And then all of a sudden, he's out of the game, and then it's coronavirus. And then the next morning, Donovan Mitchell also has it. And, of course, every Jazz fan is freaking out. The NBA is shutting down. Sports across the world are shutting down. 
to, to what a couple of days later there was the report that that those two donovan mitchell and rudy gobert their relationship was going to be unsalvageable mm-hmm. they weren't going to be able to stick together on the same floor and then they have the best record in the nba this season they become incredibly resilient playing games without donovan playing games without mike conley they never lost more than two games in a row this season they go down 1-0 to open the series against the grizzlies and then win four of them. they just continue to have answers for all the major doubts, including last season when it seems like one of those two players was going to have to be traded. What's the best case scenario for them going forward? Uh, I mean, as far as, as far as matchup, uh, I'm not sure they're really all that concerned about either Dallas or the Clippers. I mean, you can see how good both of those teams are. And Luka Doncic might be the best player left in the Western conference. And that includes LeBron James. I mean, he's just an absolute superstar and, I'm of the opinion that any time Luka Doncic is going to enter a, a playoff series, he's going to win two games. So so you're looking at at least a six-game series, regardless of how these two teams match up. And you can probably say the same thing with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. So the Jazz, though, at this level, when you see when they play like they did last night, I mean, I think there's a real belief growing with this team that they can get to the finals. And then you just hope you, you get a favorable matchup and you're healthy. But I, I don't think the Jazz look at this Western Conference landscape right now and don't think that they don't have a chance to, uh, to emerge as a favorite. Yeah, as the one seed, first team to move on in the West. I mean, they're they're the hunted right now, right? They're they're not the hunters. They're the hunted. And what was it like to just see Jazz fans again? Yeah, I mean, it's been great. Honestly, it's it's enjoyable, and I, I know everyone probably felt the same way of thinking, oh, this might be weird to see everyone in a full building again. I know Texas got way ahead of the ball game with it and, and was having uh, hosting fans at major league games, but. You know, the Jazz were actually pretty quick when it came to the NBA. They opened the season with 1,500 fans. About a month and a half in, it went up to 3,200 fans. And then it was 7,000 and then 13,000. And now uh, coming up in game one, they're going to have the full 18, 8, 11, I think is the the total capacity right now. It's going to be full, and it's been great. You know, uh, other than a few ugly incidents with a couple of fans that were harassing uh, John Moran's family, which, you know, is just the nonsense that's going on in the NBA right now, unfortunately. It's been fun, and the crowds have been good, and obviously it just makes the product so much better than what we had last year in the bubble. Oh, man, that 18-plus thousand is going to be absolutely insane. Uh, But I did notice you brought up the the fan incidents. We've seen that across the NBA this postseason, but there were some with with the Jazz series. But I did notice John Morant's comments and and him – you know, saying that he was going to root for the Jazz moving forward because of the way the organization handled those fan incidents. Uh, I, I guess that that's, you know, you hate that they're happening, but uh, I guess the Jazz are taking care of them the way they should, that John Morant's feeling that way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and look, the Jazz have work to do. Uh, I mean, this isn't the first time this has happened in Utah, and Utah needs to represent itself better, and, and the people who need to enforce that are, are the Jazz owners, and they did go under, uh, they did undergo an ownership change uh, in the last few months, the Miller family, who had owned it forever, sold it to Ryan Smith, who's kind of a tech billion uh, tech billionaire out here in the state of Utah. And he's just taken a far more aggressive and progressive approach to these types of things. He's giving out scholarships for every jazz win to, you know, underappreciated and underrepresented communities in the state of Utah. And, and when we're getting these, these, you know, issues of harassment from fans towards players and players families based on race, it's just, it, it's, ridiculous in this era to be doing that it's embarrassing for the state of utah it continues a bad image that the state has earned historically so they're trying to change that and and you you know you have to swing the pendulum back pretty far if you want to fix those issues and i think that's what ryan smith and now you know minority owner Dwayne wade is, is trying to do they're trying to show that it doesn't have to be that way in utah that doesn't have to be the perception of the state and you have to take kind of major steps to fix it yeah ben one of the things i i thought about you know the you know Hatefulness notwithstanding, I think people maybe forgot how to act all over the country too a little bit. You know, I've been out and then like you're out in a stadium for the first time forever and then like all your bile and hatefulness just comes spilling out. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm totally with you. I, I, I do think there's absolutely a reason why as soon as fans are getting back into the arenas across the country, we're getting all these ridiculous, you know, uh, outbreaks from fans, whether it was a guy trying to run onto the floor at the was it the Wizards game? It was the Philadelphia fan pouring popcorn on Russell Westbrook. It, it was just you know we've had two bins, and you're right. I think people have just been pent up for 12 months, 16 months, however long it's been now. I think everyone's lost track, and, and they get back into this public sense, and they think you know it's time to behave like a moron. And, and, and unfortunately, we're going to see that because fans have always acted like morons at times, and hopefully now we just realize, hey, okay, you got your week out, you, you had your opportunity to, to act like a fool. The NBA needs to start enforcing this better. 
But I do think it absolutely is a reaction somewhat to what's been going on for the last 12 months of people just being stuck inside. And that's not an excuse for it, but I do think that's part of it. Then uh, final question, just to kind of wrap it up uh, and going back to Royce, how have the Jazz fans grown to embrace Royce? Uh, how how do they feel about him out there in Utah as, uh, you know, not only he plays well, but he's been around there for a while now, just signed that contract well, last year, I think, or two years ago. Uh, what's kind of the, the opinion of the Jazz fans and Royce O'Neal? He's a classic jazz player. I mean, there are Royce O'Neal's, and maybe this is true for every team in NBA history, but, you know, he, he's got this kind of, like I mentioned, classic jazz DNA, which dates back to guys like Paul Millsap, who were underappreciated and came in and worked hard and earned a bunch of money. John Stockton did the same thing, underappreciated, turned into a star. He's just a guy who comes in, he brings his lunch pail to work, he does his job, he never gets in trouble. His mom comes to games, wears his jersey, is a huge fan. She's celebrated when she's around. So he, he's just a love here. He's exactly what the Jazz have been looking for. And, you know, $10 million a year, I'm sure Jazz fans never thought they'd be having to pay him that much to keep him around based on his first few seasons. But when he gives you 17 points and hits four threes in a playoff game, I mean, he's a bargain at this point, which just makes him all the more likable. Ben Anderson, KSL Sports, Salt Lake City, here with us on Sikkim 365 Radio. Ben, thanks for joining us. Thanks, guys. All right, there you go. Yeah. Royce O'Neal, great story. Great story. I mean, like, and he was at... He was at the University of Denver, you know, when he came out of Colleen. And then, and then of course, he, you know, transferred to Baylor. And I think he got to play right away because he got, like, the special – because he had a family member that was that was ill that he needed to come and, and, and help tend to uh, back home in Colleen. And so, uh, comes to Baylor. And, I, I you know, Strong and I had actually done one of his games in high school. And, like, he was a good player. But at the time, I thought, well, he's at the University of Denver's about right. He's pretty good. But – when he came to Baylor, he just got better and better and better and better. Another one of those Scott Drew transfers that worked out, uh, you know, exactly as you would have wanted it to. Uh, yeah, it's almost like Scott Drew knows what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of kind of knows what he's doing. So uh, what a career for Royce to, to have, you know, carved out in the NBA so far. Uh, like I mentioned, he signed that new deal not that long ago, a four-year deal. Uh, so he's, you know, he's a millionaire and uh, hopefully taking care of his money and taking care of his body so he can be doing this for a long time because I think he can only get better and better. Uh, you know, he's, he's already showing signs of improvement just this year. Uh, and if he continues to get better offensively and he's hitting threes on a consistent basis with his defense, uh, yeah, he's, he's going to be more than a solid player and he's already a solid player. Uh, so Jazz have booked their ticket. They might face the Mavericks. Uh, they might face the Clippers. We will see on that. But uh, they're the number one seed for a reason. And it's cool that, uh, you know, there's a Baylor guy on the, the number one team in the West and, and a guy that, you know, is having an impact. He's not just on the end of the bench and, you know, on the roster. Uh, and Royce is a big part of what the Jazz do. So very happy for him. Also, also a Central Texas guy, as you mentioned, being down from the clean area. So uh, double whammy in a good way right there. When we 